Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, April 28th, 5.28 a.m. Central Time as I speak here. Uh, big crowd this morning. Mackenzie, good morning. Matt Bennett, good morning. How are you guys? Morning. I'm doing great. How are you? Um, I'm doing better than the markets. Uh, Mackenzie, where do you want to start this morning? So corn and wheat futures posted fresh lows yesterday and into this morning. The nearby July 2023 corn contract traded at its lowest level since July of last year overnight. The December 2023 con corn contract posted its lowest trade since January 2022. The July 2023 SRW wheat contract posted its lowest trade since July of 2021 spring wheat futures also posted fresh lows. HRW wheat futures are at risk of posting fresh lows here this morning. All right, Matt, it's a bloodbath out here. Um, what are your thoughts before we get into the news and the reasoning? Uh, what are you seeing among farmers? What are farmer attitudes right now? Well, I think you, you know what they are. They're not great. I no. think a lot of folks, uh, we've talked about this for a while, Joe, you and I have talked about it several times that, you know, this market lulled people to sleep for months. It did. Uh, it just what people said all winter. Hey, Matt, when's this market ever going to do something? I'm like, dude, be careful what you wish for. You're sitting here complaining about 680 corn. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's not a great idea. So now all of a sudden you tumble, uh, you tumble, uh, as McKenzie said, to levels we haven't seen since either last summer or uh, on the case of December corn. I mean, you're, you're looking at a year ago plus. And so, you know, yeah, people are frustrated with themselves at this stage of the game, wondering if we're going to get a bounce, what the situation is. As you and I talked, I've been trying to tell people, uh, you know what, uh, look at your insurance as far as new crop goes. There's definitely uh, protections in place for you if you continue to tumble. Uh, but let's be honest, Joe. Uh, we all knew that at some point this market had uh, the capability of tumbling. We don't typically see three straight years of extremely good prices. And so we have to learn from the past and at least protect ourselves. And right now, people are frustrated they didn't do so. Here's a question for you that I've uh, received from a number of subscribers and viewers here this week. What about weather premium? It, it's too early to take all the weather premium out of the markets, yet they appear to be doing exactly that. Is this just... Is it a fund liquidation event? Is it um, is it just the, the market thinks we're well enough supplied, even with some sort of weather issue? I mean, is 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 this weather premium thing like something we should be looking for or it just doesn't matter? No, I mean, I think that that's a valid point. I think what really got the ball rolling on this, Joe, as you know, I mean, Brazil supplies are so much cheaper than U.S., both corn and beans. And then yeah. all of a sudden China steps in and says, you know what, we're going to pull an old trick out of our book, you know, that yep. we're, we're going to cancel some uh, uh, shipments of corn. You know, what are they doing most likely? Trying to buy cheaper corn. I mean, they've done this a thousand times in the past, and we should know that this is uh, this is just kind of the way that it goes. Now, so I guess what you're getting at is, is uh, are we just going to continue precipitously lower, uh, you know, and ignore the fact that we're still very tight as far as old crops concerned? You know, heck, well, some people might argue that now the, the tightness thing like it's oh. with this with this export stuff and we'll get to i agree i mean yeah. you're gonna lose exports with yeah. the with the cancellations uh, i will say you know some people are, are, are talking a little bit about ethanol yes margins have come back but let's face it uh, we just want to meet the usda goal at this point so you know you're probably going to see carry out grow a little bit I, I i would assume you know the may reports can be an interesting one as you know i mean it, it, it's there's gonna be a lot to look at a lot to digest but we're still relatively tight even if we lose exports uh, you're, you're still looking at uh, well under that 12 percent level that you typically get a demand rationing rally uh, my personal opinion is that uh, uh, you're going to have to have some weather premium at some point the problem is from what point Right. Mackenzie, let's get to this China cancellation story Matt mentioned. Yes. So USDA reported another flash cancellation of U.S. corn to China on Thursday. Private exporters reported the cancellation of sales of 233,000 metric tons, 9 million bushels of U.S. corn for delivery to China during the current marketing year. This is the second cancellation of U.S. corn sales to China this week. A cancellation of 327,000 metric tons was reported on Monday. Chinese corn cancellations this week total 560,000 metric tons or about 22 million bushels. So 22 million bushels. That's what they canceled this week. And who knows, there could be more. I mean, there there could be more behind this. Maybe that's why the market is acting the way that it is. Uh, my assumption would be that now that China has this arrangement set up with Brazil, they can buy as much Brazilian corn as, as they want. Uh, apparently, that's probably what they're waiting for, right? 
I would, I would assume the same thing. I mean, there's no question, especially as I just mentioned. I mean, Brazil corn's cheaper. I mean, uh, whenever it's as much cheaper. I mean, we've seen uh, some folks have talked 80, 90 cents, you know, in yeah. places. Of course, it depends on where you pick it up, shipping and whatnot. But bottom line is cheaper, and it's substantially cheaper. So, yes, I, I think, you know, if China wanted to go ahead and purchase, even if it was purchasing Brazil corn, you and I both know what they've done here this week has done nothing but benefit themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. it's just driven the price of corn down both there and here. So uh, bottom line is uh, they made a smart move. Yeah, that's the way that it looks. Uh, one thing that, that should be noted is, okay, China can buy corn from Brazil now, but just because they can do that, that doesn't uh, add or subtract corn from the global balance sheets. It's going to shift demand around. So we're going to lose some Chinese corn business, but we should pick it up uh, elsewhere would be my guess. We also had a weekly export sales report yesterday, Mackenzie. Yes, weekly U.S. corn export sales increased on the week. Net corn sales for the current marketing year totaled 400,000 metric tons. The print was up 28% for the week, but down 49% from the prior four-week average. Japan, Mexico, and Colombia were the largest buyers. Accumulated corn sales for the current marketing year are down 33% versus the same period last year. Net soybean sales for the current marketing year totaled 311,300 metric tons. The print increased a whopping 211% versus the previous week and 38% from the prior four-week average. Wheat sales were poor at 155,700 metric tons. Even though we were up a little bit on the week in row crops, I mean, 400,000 in corn is not a good print seasonally. Uh, even beans at 311 should be better. So, I mean, I guess the question at this point is, is how much does USDA trim off the export projection? Because I think, I think it's like almost unanimous at this point that it's coming down. Oh, it's certainly going to come down. You know, how much, as you say, is, is is going to be the biggest question. I think corn's where we're going to be watching, maybe the closest. You know, as far as soybeans go, uh, the assumption is that maybe they didn't do enough this last report and that carryout was even tighter. So maybe soybeans doesn't move around a whole lot. As far as corn goes, though, I think at least 50 million bushels uh, that are probably going to end up uh, lowering exports. There's been a lot of talk about uh, soybeans and how Chinese demand just isn't where it's supposed to be. I think there were there was one comment on the Newswire this morning. Uh, Cargill's CEO in Brazil said he's kind of disappointed in Chinese soybean demand overall. And we've seen a lot of comments uh, kind of mirroring that idea. So if Brazil's got this monster crop, the Chinese demand isn't there. Uh, China or uh, Brazilian beans, rather, are just drastically underpriced versus U.S. beans. I mean, we're going to have um, a demand problem, certainly. Uh, this is a story, this next one that kind of flew under the radar yesterday, I think. Indonesia will ease restrictions regarding palm oil exports. The country banned all exports of palm oil for three weeks last year in an effort to reduce domestic prices. The government relaxed the policy shortly after, but kept some restrictions in place. This week, Indonesia announced a further relaxation of exports that will allow more palm oil to hit the global market. Beginning in May, the government will allow producers to export six times the volume sold domestically, up from a multiple of four previously. Palm oil is the world's most produced and most consumed vegetable oil on the planet. Indonesia is the world's largest palm oil producer and exporter. This is bearish beans and bearish bean oil in particular. And the beans, Matt, I mean, the, the bean market's the one that's actually held up the best. I mean, we're not printing like fresh multi-month lows in soybean contracts yet. Uh, maybe we will be by the end of the day today, for all I know. But uh, it's, it's acted better uh, on a relative basis. It has acted better, but as you suggest, I mean, we can't forget it is month end. I mean, who knows what's going to happen today? Quite frankly, it wouldn't First surprise me. Today too. Oh, absolutely. It wouldn't surprise me at all if beans don't come in here and have some issues. But I would say it's kind of a nice overnight market, quite frankly. Uh, corn went down and touched that low from last, uh, or was right at that low from last summer and kind of bounced off of it. Hopefully, we don't go back down there and blow through it today. But uh, as far as bean prices go, I'd be concerned. I mean, I've talked to a lot of folks that have said, you know, I don't want to sell beans at twelve fifty. It seems like yesterday they were at 14 bucks. Well, you know, good for you. I mean, that doesn't mean that uh, you can't step in and sell a few soybeans. I mean, still, historically, twelve fifty beans basis of board are awfully good prices. It's just the margins are not what they were. I mean, a lot of guys aren't making money with the board at twelve fifty for new crop, which is right. I uh, not. It's, it's not a good deal. Uh, this next story, we've actually got some potentially uh, positive news this morning. Ethanol. The U.S. <clears throat> excuse me. The 
the U.S. ethanol industry is uh, pushing to ensure the use of corn ethanol in U.S. aviation fuel. The ethanol lobby is acting to ensure that aviation made with ethanol will qualify for subsidies under the Inflation Reduction Act. Jeff Cooper of the Renewable Fuels Association said over the last 18 months, there's been a growing recognition in our industry that long term, you've got to be looking at new uses and new markets and non-traditional applications for ethanol if you're going to continue to grow our industry and its value. There are some details regarding emissions that will need to be agreed upon. Yeah, we definitely need the demand given this big push for electric vehicles, the way that it sounds. There's a couple of uh, issues or like um, things that they're going to have to get through here. Uh, In the Inflation Reduction Act, they're talking about emissions. Um, Sustainable aviation fuel is going to need to yield a 50% reduction in life cycle emissions compared with petroleum-based jet fuel to qualify for the credit. But there's different ways of measuring it. So this is just some details here. This This is going to be a big deal, but just not today. Absolutely. You know, it's something I've talked about a little bit this winter. I mean, obviously, renewable diesel this winter was probably the winner as far as getting the most attention whenever it comes to renewable fuels. But, you know, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, how much ethanol you could gobble up there would just dwarf uh, what we're going to use for soybean oil as far as uh, renewable diesel goes. But again, as you suggest, it's not today. It's not necessarily tomorrow. It's going to come down the road, uh, but it certainly could be a major driver. And quite frankly, it could save what I would call a very mature industry. There's a lot more EVs on the road now than there was just a year ago, the way I see it. And uh, that's going to continue. I mean, the trend's going to continue. But ideally, uh, and, and I think this will happen, the uh, sustainable aviation fuel deal is going to offset the the demand that we lose there. Uh, let's go to Argentina. Soybean production estimates from Argentina continue to decline. Last week, the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange pegged the country's soybean crop at 22.5 million metric tons. They estimated that the crop was 28% harvested through Wednesday this week. The exchange warned that the current production estimate could be reduced even further as farmers continue to report poor yields and lower harvested acreage. Just file this as old news. Doesn't matter anymore, Matt. No, it doesn't really matter anymore, but something jogged my memory whenever you were talking earlier about shifting around corn demand. I mean, what you got to understand is that uh, they still want to be the number one world soybean meal exporter if they can be. How are they going to do that? They're going to take beans from Brazil, maybe 12, 14 million tons potentially. So if that's the case, those beans aren't going somewhere else in the world. So yeah, Brazil's got a huge crop, but Argentina having a, a crappy crop certainly, you know, is going to end up uh, changing the dynamics of this bean market somewhat. Yeah, let's get to this GDP data. U.S. economic activity grew at a slower than expected pace in the first quarter. Gross domestic product increased at an annualized rate of 1.1% during the first quarter of 2023. The reading was much lower than the previous two quarters when annualized growth was 2.9% and 3.2%. 3.2 percent, respectively. Consumer spending increased, but was offset by businesses reducing inventory investment in anticipation of weaker demand. The first quarter was likely a high point for economic growth this year. Minimal GDP growth is anticipated in the second quarter, followed by a recession in the back half of 2023. Okay, people think I'm crazy when I say this, but recessions are not good for commodity markets. I'm going to read you guys something. Ed Yardeni uh, from Yardeni Research wrote this last year. He's a well-respected guy, been in uh, the finance business for a while, but he's talking about commodities here as it relates to recession. In the commodity pits, traders often say the best cure for high commodity prices is high commodity prices. That's because when a commodity price soars, it depresses demand for the commodity and stimulates the supply of it. History shows that an even better cure for high commodity prices is a recession. During the late phase of economic expansions, the economy tends to boom. That drives up commodity prices, which boosts inflation. That forces central banks to tighten monetary conditions, which results in a recession. Commodity prices tumble during recessions, and so does inflation. Does that ring a bell, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is that... I've never heard it explained better than that, and, and as simply as that. A lot of people, though, Joe, and you've heard a lot of people say that as soon as you get into an issue with the equities markets, people fly to quality. And that does happen to an extent. And commodities sometimes might include that. But at the same time, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. It goes the other way. And so I think that if you get into a recession, there's going to be money pulled off the table. Uh, There's certainly going to be some scared investors. And you're going to have to have one hell of a story, in my opinion, uh, if you're going to have people step in here and buy up commodities to levels uh, even close to what we've seen over the last year. I'm not necessarily a big like recession guy. I feel like it's been predicted for months and months and months. And it's just like, 
we're not quite there. We did have the two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, but the uh, the government people that that get to pick whether or not we're in a recession said, no, we're not there yet. So I don't know. Interesting deal, but guys, recessions are not good for commodities. I've got a bunch of charts that I've sent out over the last couple of years uh, kind of uh, explaining how all that works. Mackenzie, cattle were higher yesterday. At least we got something good to talk about. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Both live and feeder cattle features were green across the board on Thursday. Feeder cattle features closed an average of 138 higher, anywhere from 62 cents to a buck 92 higher. Live cattle futures close an average of 33 cents higher, anywhere from 5 to 92 cents higher. Cash cattle trade was basically non-existent on Thursday. Um, we saw some sales back on Wednesday of 180. Uh, Choice box beef had a pretty darn good day. Closed the day at 311.07. That was up a buck 83. That's the highest choice box beef price we've seen since September 2021 and record high for yesterday's date. Select end of the day at 289.09. That was up at 115. Matt, cattle market thoughts? Well, yesterday I kind of expected maybe cattle would perform even better with corn down 15 to 20 cents. Well, that was yeah. my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I think you've got maybe some hesitant investors out there that are saying, eh, I don't know if we want to run this thing all the way up to uh, new highs or not. So yeah, you know me, Joe, I've been a bull on cattle for quite some time. Uh, but yesterday I wasn't super impressed, I guess is the best way to put it. I still think long term, your numbers are going to are going to force this cattle market into a, a pretty dynamic situation. I don't know exactly when that happens, but I do think you'll see new highs. I just don't think it's going to happen in the short term. Mackenzie, how would you describe attitudes among ranchers, people in your neighborhood at least? Uh, fairly positive, I guess. In my neighborhood, it's not as great as elsewhere because we're so dry here. Um, so things look pretty bleak going into the summer. Honestly, things look pretty bleak even for us. We don't know what we're going to do for grass at this point, but the, I mean, thank God we have these good prices right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Outside markets this morning, guys, us dollars a little bit higher, uh, stock markets off the S and P's down 15, the Dow's down one thirty. Gold's off six bucks. Crude oil is up 21 cents at 74.97. Can't hold a rally in crude. Have a great weekend guys. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. All right. Yeah, absolutely. You too.